Thank you, Susie, for making me do a great presentation. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's interesting being here at the Cranberry Barnes & Noble because this is my uh, hometown bookstore. I'm usually browsing through the eyes looking for books. It's a little different giving a presentation. But I do want to thank Susie and uh, Wei Ming Hare and Dave Brown and Kim Shoemaker from Barnes & Noble for making this possible and also to uh, C-SPAN 2 and Book TV for, for covering. We will do a Q&A afterwards, so ask good questions because you might be on television. But I'm going to start with a question for myself, if that's okay, which is, I get a lot. Why would a sports guy write a book about Flight 93? Some of you may, may know I work for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And it's because no one else did. And apparently no one was going to for a while. And I thought the story needed to be told. I'm a history buff and I go to Gettysburg all the time. And I had been out to the temporary memorial probably 10 times in the, in the first 10 years, maybe more than that. It's only about 90 miles from, from Pittsburgh where, uh, where the flight crashed. And I wanted to read more and learn more and was frustrated that I couldn't do that. There is an ama amazing little, amazing little amount in book form written about September 11th and specifically about Flight 93. There was one book about Flight 93 written uh, less than a year after the crash. The author, Jerry Longman, did a great job, but there just wasn't much known back then. And, and all the time since then, nothing has happened. So much more has come out. And I just thought the story deserved a narrative a full narrative from beginning to end, not just the flight. The movie United 93, which is great, is just the flight. Documentary is just the flight. My book starts with, starts in 1996 when the plot was first proposed to Osama bin Laden and it goes through the 10th anniversary in 2011 when the Flight 93 National Memorial uh, was, was dedicated. Uh, the flight, the two chapters on the flight are actually in the middle of the book. The after story in Somerset County also really fascinated me. I also thought that um, the story's being forgotten a little bit. If you look in the media now and the anniversaries and you hear September 11th, you see the plane hitting the tower, you see the Pentagon, you might see a few seconds of an empty field in Somerset County with a hole. I mean, it, it's, almost, it's known as the attacks on New York City and Washington. I think over time, this great story has faded. I also volunteer out at the site and the spring tours are middle school students they have little or no recollection. There's already a half generation out there that doesn't remember this day the way, the way we do. Some of you guys would not, the, the, the bewilderment and terror that we felt that day. So that was all, all part of the reason for doing this. Now, the, uh, you, you can do the story, obviously, on, uh, on, on all the details, but it gets down to people. To me, it's people. If you had been at the Newark International Airport the morning of September 11th, 2001, and about 7.30, and you walked past gate 17, you would have seen 33 regular passengers and seven crew getting ready for a, what they thought was a routine flight to San Francisco. 8 a.m. takeoff, United Flight 93. Uh, there were businessmen and grandparents and college students flying for all the usual reasons, to go to a conference, to go on vacation, to go home. One lady had been east to attend her grandmother's funeral. One man had been east to attend his grandmother's 100th birthday party. The reasons that we all travel, um, regular people. Some of the names have been known to history. Todd Beamer certainly is the, is the singular name about Flight 93 most people recognize. He made a call and said, let's roll. But there's some others uh, who I'd like to introduce to you right now who, whose names aren't remembered but were on that flight. It gives us a little bit of a you and me element to this. Diora Bodley was 20 years old. She was the youngest person on Flight 93. She was from San Diego. She was about to enter her junior year at Santa Clara University. She had been east visiting friends in New Jersey and Connecticut. And her mother told me that she was actually ticketed on a flight later that day. She got up, thought, I'll fly home early. Maybe I can go standby. Almost no one on Flight 93. She got on the flight, was probably very excited that that happened. Hilda Marson was the exact opposite. She was 79 years old. She was the oldest person on Flight 93. Hilda was born in Germany, came to the country when she was six years old with her parents, went through Ellis Island, did not speak a word of English, became as American as you could be, married a policeman, raised two daughters, became a bookkeeper uh, in, a, in a teacher's age. She was feisty. The family legend has it that a mugger once approached her at a bus stop. She hit him over the head with an umbrella. Um, but she was very excited because she wasn't going on vacation. She was moving. This is a new part of life for her. She was moving to San Francisco to live with her adult daughter and her daughter's husband. She'd packed four suitcases. Her daughter uh, told me she was so excited to be thinking about going to the airport that morning to pick up her mother for this new phase of her life. 
Um, John Talignani was also in his 70s. He was a World War II veteran. He, uh, he was a retired bartender at, uh, at the Palm Restaurant in New York, so he could spin a yarn. But he was traveling with a heavy heart because his stepson had recently been married, had gone to California on his honeymoon. His stepson had died in a car accident on the honeymoon. So John was going to the funeral and to collect the remains. The last one I'll show you is Wanda Green. Wanda was one of five flight attendants on board, uh, one of three African Americans in the flight crew. She was a 29-year veteran of United Airlines, but she was dabbling in a new career. She wanted to work in real estate, had a dream of opening her own real estate office. She was scheduled to fly on uh, September 13th, but uh, she thought she might have a house closing that day. So she asked her boss for a change in schedule and ended up flying on September 11th. They all, they all boarded the plane in a timely fashion, obviously the crew first. The passengers got on. Uh, the plane pulled back from the gate at 8.01, and then it sat there. Flight 93 did not take off until 8.42, and that delay is crucial in the story. The first line of the book is, Flight 93 was late. If it had taken off 15 or 20 minutes earlier, our view of this day might have been a lot different because there were four other, there were four other men, sorry about that, there were four other men on the flight who knew they weren't coming home. They were part, this is a story that's, that's well known, they were part of a 19-man terrorist team sent by Al-Qaeda to hijack four planes that morning and fly them into buildings that symbolized American dominance. But their plan was based on absolute precision. Naturally, they were going to West Coast flights with lots of fuel, so when the crashes happened, there were big explosions. But they were to take off in a 25-minute time period. The first one at 7.45, the last one at 8.10. The idea being that these things would happen so fast that no one, not the FAA, not the military, not the passengers on the planes, could do anything about it. The, the issue with Flight 93, though, you'll, you'll notice that we talk about 19 hijackers not 20. Al-Qaeda wanted 20. They couldn't get the 20th hijacker in. They wanted four five-man teams. That'd be one pilot, an Al-Qaeda member who'd been here for about a year, training on small planes, private pilots licensed mostly in schools in Florida. Then they trained on simulators. They never flew the big planes, but they did simulators 757s, 767s, uh, because they weren't going to have to take off and land. They were just going to have to steer the planes in the building. So they thought they could get, uh, get by with that, and they did one pilot and four muscle hijackers. Two to attack the cockpit and take care of the pilot and co-pilot, kill or disable them, and two to herd the passengers and crew to the back of the plane. Five-man team. Flight 93 had four. They only had three muscle hijackers. Did that play a role in what happened later? It very well could have been. It also probably played a role in the other delay, which was important, which was that this crew took the longest to hijack the plane. Al-Qaeda's plan was that they would take over the plane in 15 minutes. We know that because two of the plotters are in Guantanamo Bay and their stories have been consistent. That ended up being probably unrealistic, but the other three planes did it in 30 minutes. The guys, the hijackers on Flight 93 took 46 minutes. Why? We don't know. We'll never know. Those are things, they're mysteries we, we can never know. Uh, the, the hijacker pilot had a girlfriend. He was the only one who had a girlfriend. He was wavering. They were afraid he was going to drop out of the plot. Did he lose his nerve for a while? It's only speculation. But it took them longer. So the combination of the delay in taking off and the delay in, in the hijack plan created an opportunity that didn't exist on the other flights, which is that these people could make telephone calls, a lot of phone calls. We hear a lot of Todd Beamer's calls. There were 37 calls made from Flight 93. The early reporting was that they were cell phone calls. The media was wrong on that. It was no criticism of the media. You, you do what you can in crisis. The early reporting is often wrong. But people were saying, oh, cell phone calls from 35,000 feet. Out of the 37 calls, there were two on cell phones. They were at the very end when the plane was under 5,000 feet. Most of the calls were from seat back phones, air phones. Remember those? Older folks in my life remember there was a white phone in the back of the seat. You could pull it out, slide your credit card through, and it was just kind of for silly calls. Hey, I'm, hey, I'm in the air. I'll be there in an hour. But these people used them effectively. They made 12 people made 35 calls on air phones. The technology was still spotty. 20 of those calls disconnected.